And we are live. Welcome, folks, to episode 3,476 of the Survival Podcast. I was like, when I was getting ready, I'm like, I should get on and be like a joker and be like, this is episode 29 million of the Survival Podcast, because it sometimes seems like we've done just so many episodes. And uh, thank you to all of you who have tuned in over the years and made this uh, productive enough to keep doing now uh, for what will soon be 16 years. We're only a few months away. From 16 years, and we're only really a handful of days away from the Bitcoin halving, which is not what we'll be talking about today. Even though Tuesdays often are Bitcoin breakout days, we'll probably do a Bitcoin breakout next week. What are we going to talk about today? 10, count them, 10, wahaha, 10 methods of composting. And uh, I know a lot of you guys are probably like, but Jack's all about the bioreactor composting as a course on it and everything and it will be one of the 10 it will be the last one i don't want to turn this into an infomercial for my compost course but what i'm going to tell you right from the beginning today is i believe that there is what we would call a gold standard result for composting but there's not a best method of composting for everybody everywhere all the time people have different amounts of material uh different tolerances different needs we always want to come down to context and so a person who has very small amounts of ongoing compost is ideally suited to something like vermicomposting and using worms. A person that has an awful lot of waste that don't really uh, break down well in a lot of conventional composting methods uh, like bioreactor or forced air static or uh, conventional high turn compost like uh, dairy and meats and things like that. Uh, not don't have a dog, I guess, to feed your your your, your meat scraps to or whatever. Um, might really do well from what's known as EM composting or bakashi, where we're actually using effective microorganisms in an anaerobic way. And even though everybody says, "Oh, we can't have anaerobes," well, we'll we'll talk about that today too. Like that person might be better suited to that. A person that uh, is maybe even doing uh, one of the other methods of composting, but really wants to up organic matter and up uh, uh, fungal activity and things like that may want to add in something like, like leaf mold composting. You know, the person that has leaves everywhere, like I don't think if I had leaves everywhere, if I like some of these neighbors, you know, down the road from me, they have so many trees that, uh, you know, they have mountains of leaves. I would at least make a couple leaf mold, mold composters if I were them. So we always have to come back to context and what's best is the thing that works for you, where you are, based on your needs, and we're going to try to cover that today. Before we do, let us go ahead and recognize our sponsors today. They do a lot to help make sure uh, that this show is here available to you Monday through Friday, five days a week. Sponsor of the day, number one today, is a long-term sponsor, a long-term supporter of the show, Jeff the Berkey Guy Gleason. You can find his website at usaberkeyfilters.com. He is the original Berkey guy himself. He is one of the top distributors for Berkey on planet Earth. That means if there's ever a problem, he can get you a resolution because when he calls, they listen. He's like E.F. Hutton, right? Remember that old commercial? And water is incredibly important. I use a Berkey filter. I think you should too. It really can't break. Nothing can really go wrong. There's no moving parts. Um, the filters are incredibly long lasting. They're very affordable. When you work it out to cost per gallon of water, it is about the least expensive method of good quality water filtration out there. Uh, and it looks great. It just looks like a very cool thing in your home. And, you know, even though I'm on a well with very clean water, I still use the Berkey filter. I find that my water just tastes better that way. And water, as we did an episode on last week, is life. And where there water, where there is water, there is peace. I'll also point out real quick when we're talking about a filtration system here. If you're on city water and you get a thing in the email or you hear alert on TV or something or an emergency phone call says, well, you're now under a boil water advisory. You see that next door or something. Something was wrong long before you got that advisory. That's when they figured it out. You know, somebody got sick and went to the ER, and then another person got sick and went to the ER. Oh, wait, maybe it's the water, right? Or somebody finally fessed up that they screwed something up or what have you. So if you're not always filtering your water, you're betting that you won't be first in line for problems like that. And also any good prepper should have a water filtration system in their homestead as well. Next up today, Start 9 Embassy Servers. 
I really recommend that you get yourself a Start9 server. I'm going to play their little video for you right now so you can hear from them why you need a Start9 digital server. We all save our data, but where is it saved? In the cloud, which is actually this building in one of these computers with millions of others. This is called a honeypot, a single place full of data worth a hacker's time to steal. But instead, if you saved your data on your own computer at home, you wouldn't be worth the attack. Saving your own data is easy. Simply plug in a Start9 device and start saving all your own data today. So, will you stay in the honeypot or will you take control of your data? Start now. Start nine. All right, guys. So the only thing I want to add to what Start9 had to say for themselves there is that a lot of times when you talk about something like a server uh, or, you know, you mentioned the, the, the concept of having fully encrypted military grade end to end encrypted messaging uh, for you, your family, your friends and your community and what have you. Uh, running nodes and things like that. People think like, can I do that? Yes, you can. If you can use a smartphone, install apps, and then use the apps, you can run a Start9 digital server. It really isn't that hard. The, the most difficult thing would be setting up like a Bitcoin node and or Lightning node. The rest of the stuff is super easy. And if you're a Bitcoin or you want to run a node, you got to learn how to do it somewhere, sometime, anyway. Anyway, with that, let's kind of dig on into this. Again, I want to come back to the concept of, you know, when I put together the first course for home food systems. I did the bioreactor composting and, and I want to explain why. So that as we go through this, you can understand why I don't turn away from all the other methods of composting there are. The reason why is I've been doing it for five years. I have an incredibly obvious track record with it. And every year that I've improved the way I'm doing it, my results have gotten better. So I knew I could teach it well. I also knew it was the method that if mastered would be enough for anybody, as long as you have enough feedstock, and most people can find feedstock, and it would work anywhere in the world. If, if you did it the way I told you to, and you kept it moist, and you didn't let it dry out, and you didn't let it freeze solid, you were going to get a great result that was going to improve your efforts, right? And once you had that, and I knew if you learned about compost by learning about that one, that you could understand any other compost method. So... Like I said, there is kind of a gold standard with results, but there's not a gold standard with method. And what I really mean by that, again, is less about will a well-made bioreactor compost be better than a high-turn conventional compost? Yeah. Yes, it will. Can you handle the high-turn compost in a way that somewhat will negate that and improve it by aging it. Yes, you're back to longevity, but you could still have it ready to go faster. Let's say, you know, 90 to 120 days instead of 365 days a full year. So it all depends on your needs. It all depends on your context. So the reason I will say that the bioreactor method is the ultimate in anything is not due to ease of use or how applicable it is to the majority of people or whatever. It's the end product. So if you have an end product, let's say, that gets an A+, plus, 100% score, is it really a terrible thing if you have something that gets like an 85, a good solid B, or a 90 or a 91 or a 92? No. And if that's what you need now or that's what fits your operation, your lifestyle, the movement of material through what you're doing, then great. And I would even say some that maybe, you know, I'm going to say are not the gold standard result are like, so like 99, you know, 98, 99%. And, you know, vermicomposting. If you told me, Jack, I, for whatever reason, and I believe you, I can't do bioreactor composting, of all these other methods, which one is going to give me the best result? I would probably tell you vermicomposting. And then I would probably say like leaf mold composting, uh, added to the worm composting would be the next. Like, there are things you can do by combining these different methods. And I'll kind of try to riff through that as we do that today. And, um, and, and I think the more you learn about compost in general, soil science in general, microbiology in general, 
and the concept of biological solutions being better than chemical solutions. And I actually want to pause on that because I say that all the time and I think I can be misconstrued with it. When I say biology over chemistry, I mean when you are trying to correct all your problems with chemistry, you will cause biology to suffer. It doesn't mean there's no place for chemistry. So I, I, I've talked about this quite a bit, uh, but in case you haven't heard it before, one of the things that we don't really, I think, drive home for people in our pathetic excuse for an education system is what an element is. Is it that elemental, right? What an element is. There are elements that the only place they can be created is in a star, in, in a, a fission reaction, right? Like hydrogen and helium don't turn into carbon on Earth. Earth has all the carbon that we will ever have right now. What it, all that changes is the location of it. It is neither created nor destroyed, right? On Earth anyway, uh, it only changes in form. And in this case, it can be in the, in the air. It can be absorbed into the ocean. It can be in the soil. It can be part of you. Carbon is what you're built out of. But whatever amount of carbon you have is what you have. Now, let's take it to something else because we're talking about growing plants today. If your soil is, let's say, deficient in molybdenum, and you are not getting it in your feedstock, right? There's nothing in the feedstock of your compost that has it. No amount of biology will generate that element in your system. If you're deficient in iron, the only thing that can create iron, if it's not already iron, is a fusion reaction. And we don't have fusion reactors in our compost or our backyard. So there is a place for chemistry in looking at you know, a soil test and saying if you're deficient in specific elements and those elements are not part of compost, compost teas and other amendments, then the only way to get those is to bring them in. And sometimes a person will do something, let's say, like make really great compost and they still are having a disease problem with a plant and they think they made bad compost or uh, they got compost that is... Uh, you know, I mean, they got it from somebody else instead of making themselves or I'm not sure their feedstock and they think, well, you know, it's got Roundup in it or something. And the reality is, unless it's absolutely saturated in it, if you make good compost, it's not even a concern. Those, those small amounts of herbicides and things like that get in our compost, they get biologically bound up, okay? And the biology also unbinds a lot of these minerals. So I had a question the other day on a video that I did about cover cropping and the person said, but will it do potassium and phosphorus? Everybody talks about nitrogen from cover cropping. And I was like, you're not looking at it the right way. There is phosphorus like crazy on this planet. <clears throat> Most of the farms that are dumping, literally dumping phosphorus on their fields every year in high quantities, what they're trying to do is dump what's called soluble phosphorus. And it can only, it can only stay that way for a very brief period of time without the biology. And then it gets locked up. And if you actually test, not for available phosphorus, but phosphorus, just how much phosphorus is in the soil, the average farm in America, where they are dumping on a ton to get 100 pounds of results, because that's that's what happens. They put it for every 1,000 pounds they put on, they'll get 100 to 300 pounds actually become available to the plant and stay available to the plant for long enough for the plant to get it before it binds up. The bound up amount, 40 plus years. You have farms with 40 years of phosphorus buying in phosphorus every year. So this, this biology can do amazing things for us, but the one thing it cannot do is create an element that doesn't exist in it or on the property that you're on. So there is a place for some chemistry, but if we can solve 90% of our problems with biology and 10% with chemistry and physics, then we should probably take that approach. So I'm coming to this very biological today, but I wanted to get that on the air so that I'm fully understood about it. All right, so let's start talking about these 10 methods of composting. I'm just going to read them off as a list so that you know what to expect, and then we'll start going through them. We're going to talk about direct composting, which is like pit, trench, lasagna composting today. We're going to talk about conventional high-turn compost. We're going to talk about vermicompost. Black soldier fly composting, leaf mold composting, tumbler composting, static pile continuous composting. We're going to talk about forced air static pile continuous. And I have some thoughts on that and why some people that are really smart people 
have done side by sides of continuous and forced air continuous and said there's no difference. But when we get to it, I'll explain why I don't know that you're looking in the right place for the difference because we are very visual people, but we can only see what we can see without magnification. Um, we're also going to talk about effective microorganism compost. That's also known as Bakashi. I'll be very brief on that because it's the one out of all of these that I have never, ever done. Um, primarily, I don't have uh, the need to deal with a significant amount of feedstock. Anything that wouldn't go in my normal compost goes into my dogs. All right. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about bioreactor compost, which I've talked about so much that we'll, I'll be brief on that. And I will, of course, throw in that we do have a course on it. So let's start off with direct composting. And direct composting means we don't really compost. We let nature do it. And for people that have an intermittent flow of kitchen waste that are compostables, banana peels, you know, um, leftover rice, uh, whatever, you know, coffee grinds, et cetera, that use mulch in their gardens, this is a really great way to go. And there, there's nothing that could be simpler about doing this. All you do is pull back your mulch, spread out a thin layer of your compostables, put the mulch back, and go on about your way. And you let the organisms in the soil where they are consume the material and transform it into soil and feed microbiology. And you might think if that's so great, why don't we just do that? It has limitations of what it could do. It will only feed the biology that exists in the soil. It will only favor certain biology, but it's a damn good way to go and it works. And it's incredibly fast. This is a good experiment. Um, I'm not a big banana eater because they're just pure sugar in my opinion, but my grandkids eat them. And so you probably have banana peels available to you. Take a banana peel and, and, and put it somewhere that it's not covered up. It'll turn brown and nasty and gross and stink and it'll finally attract insects and eventually it'll rot to nothing. Take the same size banana peel, pull back some mulch on a healthy biologically active garden, put that banana peel down and cover it up. It is likely that, with it, especially in a warm part of the year, like if you do this in the middle of winter, that's different. And, and this is actually another reason that it has limitations. Like it's going to work best from spring to fall. Once you start getting overnight freezes and stuff, your microbiological biological activity goes down. But in, in like from, you know, any kind of temperate part of the season, you're probably going to pull that mulch back in about 48 hours and find nothing. So you know it's been incorporated into your soil and you know it uh, fed microorganisms. That's one way to do this. Another way to do it, though, for direct composting is what's called lasagna gardening. And lasagna gardening is where you're doing layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. The issue with lasagna gardening, I don't really consider it directly a composting method because it's kind of a once and done uh, or once a season as you're adding layers. But all you do is make one layer of your lasagna food scraps. That's it. And I'm not going to get deep into lasagna gardening today. It's its own subject. It's also not something I do. And I try not to talk too much about things that I don't do because then you're speaking theory instead of practical uh, experience. Uh, but it works really well for some people. What I do like doing, if you have large amounts of waste at one time, you don't want a lasagna garden. You don't want a worm bin, you don't have enough space for worm bins and all, is trenching. And trenching is a beautiful way to go with this. And you can do it right in the middle of the season too, as long as you're growing in basic rows with your gardening. Um, you can also do shorter rows going across your beds and sit a long ways. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Pull back your mulch, dig a trench, fill the trench with your food scraps, backfill the trench, push the mulch back. That's all you got to do. It feeds the hell out of worms. It's a great way to go. And there's other versions of this. Um, a lot of places when they talk about different methods of composting, trying to make as many as possible, will use things like a worm tower or a keyhole garden where we, we build the garden and we put a big piece of pipe in it with some holes in and out and we just constantly throw our food waste into that pipe. And people a lot of times will say, well, the problem with that is all your nutrition, all your plant nutrition and everything is right here in this one place. But remember, we're not feeding the plants. 
they're not feed. The, the entire idea that we are using compost to feed plants is so backwards, and it's why so many mistakes get made by so many people who are actually very smart people. If you think you're doing something that you're not, no matter how smart, in fact, maybe the smarter you are, the worse it will be. Because believing something to be true that isn't true and then acting on that is going to lead to bad decisions, a fallacy. So the truth is we're feeding soil microorganisms. No matter what you do, if you're growing plants, you're actually a livestock farmer. You're a rancher. You're ranching things like nematodes and amoeba and protozoa, right? You're, you're ranching uh, pill bugs. You're ranching little snakes that look like worms, uh, smooth and rough earth snakes, which are going to feed on slugs and then deposit their little snake poop in your garden. They're there. It's okay. Don't be afraid of them. They can't hurt you. I find them all the time. The more I get biological activity going in my garden, the more times I'll pull back mulch and you see this little snake that's like smaller around than your finger, you know, and they might get six, eight inches long. They won't, you can't make them bite you. And yet when I find one here and I have students here, inevitably there's a couple that are like running away. They're like that meme with the people hiding from the little fluffy rabbit. Like this thing cannot harm you in any way, right? But the more you build up the biology like that, the more tilth your soil will have, the more health your soil will have, the more it will behave like a natural system because, well, it is. And that's what we're doing. We're feeding the microorganisms. So if we do a worm tower, and then, you know, a lot of our plants are too far to directly reach that worm tower. You know, it's not too far to reach it. The fungi that are it, it, working with the plants will literally reach out. And the plants will reach further out than you think. In my research on cover cropping, for instance, I, I found some of the work that uh, Gabe Brown's doing, uh, D Dale Strickler's confirmed this as well, that they're planting, let's say, an 18-inch row spacing of cover crop. And they have a pea in one row and a daikon radish in the other row. And the, the peas actually produce more nitrogen because the daikon, even though we think of it as this long, giant carrot, looks like a giant white carrot, right? Actually has really long hair roots and they will reach out that full 18 inches. And they will start to actually harvest the nitrogen that the rhizobial bacteria are fixing in cooperation with the pea. And because it's being pulled from, the pea will grow more aggressively and the bacteria will make more of it. So everybody gets more by this symbiotic relationship. So your worm tower, your keyhole garden, anything like that, you're going to have these fungal hyphae and plant root networks reaching out. And then you're also just growing and cultivating the entirety of uh, your soil life. Next up is what we will call conventional high turn compost. I don't care if they're long windrows or one big one square meter pile. It doesn't matter. All I'm talking about is a compost where you do a mix of nitrogens and carbons. And every three to four days, you turn it. It comes up to a certain temperature and you turn it to restart it. And then it comes up to a temperature and you turn it to restart it. And most of these composts can be completed. We're going to talk about that in a second. What I mean when I say that, they can be completed in 18 to 28 days. And if you really push it, I've seen Jeff Lawton prove it can be done in 16. Um, this is what I don't recommend. I don't recommend this method of composting. It's not that it's bad. And I'm going to talk about what's good about it. But first, I want to tell you what I, what I have decided makes it not worth doing for me. I have all these other methods. They are far less labor intensive. When I get done, that 28-day cycle of turning that compost, the last thing I want to do with that compost at that moment is use it in my garden. You can, but it is extremely weak from a biology standpoint. It is almost completely devoid of fungi. And the reason is every time the fungi start to try to form hyphae in that pile and you turn it, you rip the hyphae apart. You have to think of the hyphae is this incredible network of spider web like strings that are microscopic. And it, it wants to go everywhere in that pile. And if you think back to like, if you were ever in the military, you know, the, one of the tricks that drill sergeants like to do is, you know, one day you'll go, and they like to do it on a day where you're not going to get back to the barracks till like nine or 10 o'clock at night. 
but you are coming back to the, you're not staying in the field that night. You're coming back really late. Maybe you're going to have like a good eight, nine mile road march back. All you want to do is hit your rack and go to sleep. But somebody screwed up, left their wall locker unlocked, didn't make their bed right. 60 dudes in a platoon, one guy screwed up, and it's time for the freaking brown round uh, tornado to hit. And the drill sergeants go in and they rip all the beds, all the, and they just throw all your shit out in the common area. And it's, you know, nine, 10 o'clock at night. You haven't slept but three hours a day for the past four days. And you're out there digging through everything to find, you have to put everything back before you can go to bed. So you're going to get about an hour and a half of sleep before you get up and do it again. When we turn compost on a high rotation turn, this is what we do to the fungi that are trying to colonize it. Is that terrible? Eh, it depends, right? When you're done making that compost, and this is what every great composter that does like chicken tractor on steroids or whatever will tell you, like Billy Bond will tell you, that compost needs to go somewhere be covered, kept moist, and left alone for at least a month. It needs to mature. You've got the compost process, and then you have the maturation process. So there's going to be tons of fungal spores in there. There's going to be tons of fungal spores that you know land, and that's why I don't like covering it with full-on tarps that are airtight. It takes a little more effort to remember to keep your compost pile moist and watered. But if you use landscape fabric, which is what I use in my bioreactors to tarp your compost, you can water right through it. And it has breathability, just like those masks that so supposedly stop microorganisms that don't, right? Like So these little microorganism spores and all can land on that and actually go through and end up inoculating and infusing your compost. So you want to age this stuff. And when you do, you get very good results. Billy Bond does this type of composting in conjunction with chickens. And he, again, it's the Jeff Lawton chicken tractor on steroids taken in his direction. And his compost is fantastic. There's nothing wrong with it. And this is what this method is best for. I want to make really good compost and I want to make a lot of it because I'm selling it. Most of the people that are selling high, now, you're not going to buy this at Home Depot or Lowe's. Understand that. Most of the people that are making high quality compost in commercial operations are going to be doing a wind, wind row form of composting because they can move the volume through in sufficient time to continue to supply their customers. Now, some of them understand the second half. The maturation. And so they're going, you know, down wind rows. And as you turn the wind rows, you're moving it to an end point. And then there is an end point where it's a storage. And then we're harvesting the oldest first to our customers. If you are going to buy compost and you find a local supplier that claims to be doing everything right, and you ask them about what I just said, and they don't know what you're talking about, but you go look at it and you think they're doing a good job then my advice would be buy the compost from them, you know, like a yard or two at a time and you age it. You age it. That needs to sit for 30 to 60 days before you start using it, especially in infusions and compost teas and compost extracts and uh, slurries on your seed and stuff like that. Like that compost, there's nothing wrong with it. It just needs time to mature. But it's also the reason if you're like, well, then why don't you do it? Because, I have a lot of volume, but not that much. I'm not making compost every week, and it's labor intensive. Whereas my bioreactors, I can fill them up once or twice a year, keep them moist, and that's it. And I'm done. And so I take a less labor intensive approach, and I get a better end product. Even if you do what I said, you will never get the biological diversity. You might get incredibly good bacteria to fungal relationships over time and a lot of diversity. But bioreactor compost, when we make it right, we'll end up with somewhere between 450 and 550 beneficial microorganism varieties. Not, not, varieties. The diversity is what where the strength is in that because we don't know exactly what our plants need, what our gardens need, what they're deficient. The more biology we introduce that are, you know, beneficial organisms, the, 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 the better the result will most likely be for us. 
And so that's why I take a little bit of a different approach. There's nothing wrong with high turn compost. And in fact, even in my course, I say, this takes a year to do. So what if I need compost this year? Make a high turn pile, make a bioreactor. Then if you make a bioreactor every year, that's big enough to produce a year's worth of compost. And I would make two, two is one, one is none. You never have to do that again. But there is places for all of these things. That's what I'm trying to get at. Next up, and I do have Joe H. with what looks like a question starred there. And uh, I think that's a question. But if you want to ask a question during this, the for the live streamers, the, the, the instructions are streaming below on the screen right now. Take a look at it. So now let's move on to vermicompost. As I said, I do feel after all the research, all the practical experience and everything, the vermicom or um, bioreactor compost is the gold standard result. <laughs> but it's the gold standard result because it is partially accomplished with vermicomposting. When we make a bioreactor, once we get through the thermophilic cycle and our core temperature is down, you know, below 90, but ideally below 80 degrees Fahrenheit, we throw some worms in there and their population explodes and they take the process forward for us. They move around the biology and what have you. If you said to me, Jack, I can't do large scale composting. What is the best thing I can do for myself? It would be vermicomposting. Worm compost is almost magic. And I'll tell you what I've been experimenting with that's not directly composting to see this. Uh, aquaponics. As you guys know, I've done aquaponics for a very, very, very long time. And, um, and Joe, we will get to that question. I'm not going to start it because there is, we're going to talk about aeration here in a second. All right. So, um, vermicompost has this magical thing. Worms propagate bacteria and fungi indirectly and intentionally. So I've seen video, for instance, of, you know, a field that has was growing corn, and this is a biologically active field. It's been done with cover crop rotations and, and biological compost. And so they harvest the corn, and they treat the corn stalks like a cover crop. They roll or crimp it right to the ground, and then they plant their winter cover crop after their corn rotation. Well, that corn, obviously, once you've crushed it to the ground, it dries up, it turns brown. We've all seen dead corn stalks. And you got these big corn leaves. I mean, this is old school corn that has, you know, not two cobs to a, you know, like might have 13, 14, 16 cobs to the stock. This is big, high stock, elephant high, you know, elephant's eye high uh, corn. So they have these huge leaves. And this field was full of these like night crawlers that you're almost afraid to go in the field at night alone because the worms might eat you. And these giant leaves are moving in the darkness. And you get down and you look at the what the worm is doing, and the worm is coming out with his little worm mouth, grabbing that giant leaf, pulling it into its burrow just a little, as far as it can, because it can't get it all the way underground, twisting it like a quarter turn, and then doing it again with it. And just constantly these worms are pulling these leaves a little bit into the soil. What are they doing? They're growing microorganisms that they're going to eat, and they're going to eat the waste product thereof. They don't really want to eat the brown leaf. They want to eat the thing that eats the brown leaf, and they know that the things, the fungi and the bacteria that will consume the leaf will consume it. And I don't know how a worm knows anything. So I'm using the only terms we have as humans. We don't have worm language. Somehow in its intrinsic intelligence, it knows if I do this thing, Right. Or maybe just the ones that did it are the ones that evolved. If I do this thing, when I come back up that burrow two days from now, there'll be lots of food there for me. So what I've been doing with some small scale aquaponics, like my uh, my student sized one that I just use for demo purposes in my garage with a couple grow lights on it. I do not have enough fish in the system to grow food, to grow plants. Right. There's not enough fish. It's like a handful of minnows in there. They do not produce enough waste. But I inoculated the, ep the one ebb and flow bed attached to it with red wigglers and your more conventional night crawlers as well. There's both in there. And I'm pulling giant clods of hair algae, that green hair algae, nasty shit out of my outdoor tanks. 
and I make these big pads and I set it on top of the ebb and flow beds on top of the Lika, the, 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 the media. And I'll just put sprinkles of fish food underneath those pads. And then you go out there and you lift that pad up the next day and there's just worms everywhere. The plants growing in that system are healthier than they have a right to be given that, you know, they're trying to make a living off the waste of some minnows. It is the worms and their and the worms are not producing enough nitrogen alone to account for the growth and the health of the plant. There's just not enough there. It is microbiology that these worms are doing. And I want you to think about when you look at worm castings, it looks like perfectly structured soil. Why? Because there are biogels emitted by the worms that create this clumping, which is a perfect, that's what you should see when you dig your soil up in your garden. Your first couple inches should be all little balls. It should be compacted. It should be little clumped together balls. You, you should have uh, a, a porosphere, right? And a gratosphere in your soil. And there is nothing that does this quite like a worm. It is absolutely fantastic. And so I believe that a person who is trying to grow a garden, as long as they're not deficient in a mineral like we talked about at the beginning, could do nothing but vermicomposting and probably never really need much or very small amounts of amendments like a decent organic fertilizer like a Dr. Earth and maybe a little bit of... Uh, a, a spray, a foliar spray of things like comfrey, uh, green manure tea, uh, and maybe some uh, liquid fish and uh, kelp. And by the way, the kelp, the, the kelp, uh, liquid kelp, along with some kelp meal, will probably, at the scale for a gardener, take care of any mineral deficiencies you would have had. Maybe a little bit of green sand added to that and a little bit of azomite. Uh, maybe a one-time amendment of those things to your garden, and, and that would be all you would need. It doesn't mean you can't do better, and uh, Mitchell's saying rock dust, and when I say azomite, that's what I'm talking about is rock dust, rock minerals. Uh, you don't need to do that forever. Like, you you add that once, and if you but then you need the biology. So this is something we need to understand with why we're talking about compost today. Let's say I put in a rock mineral, and that rock mineral contains molybdenum. Uh, that plant can't get it by itself. It can't go into that, you know, you see that little tiny rock dust? That's a boulder to that plant. And it could stick its little root on there and go, hmm, it's in there. But it can't directly access those minerals. It needs to interact with other soil biology to get those minerals. And if we have worms, you're, you're, you're never going to have a deficiency in microbiology, both bacterial and fungal. So worm composting and I do have some items uh, from Vivor, and this is the one I recently ran in. It's today's item of the day, actually, and it is on sale, and that's why I brought it back as the item of the day. It just happened that I did this episode. It wasn't planned. Uh, but Vivor has a really great five-tray worm farm, and it's a – I mean, there's worm farms that look just like this selling for 100 120 bucks on Amazon. They have it on sale right now for 69 bucks. I will tell you that one of the people in the Telegram group ordered this and it showed up without a lid. <laughs> There's a piece missing. And I guess if you sell millions of anything, there will be an error here and there. He said, Vivor said, we will take care of it. We will send you a new lid as soon as they, the next shipment of them comes in. So I will just say if I was missing a lid from this thing, I would just improvise a lid until it showed up. But I don't expect that. I've only heard that from one person and quite a few of these have been bought. But a worm farm is the way to go with this. Probably your best met, best bet is to have some sort of multi-layered worm farm. I do use the Urban Worm Bag uh, for myself because it's very ant-proof and it works well as an indoor composting system. And I have a lot of fire ant problems here. Uh, this one for Vivor, I may request one of them just to, to put it through its paces. Uh, it does have some little feet that you can fill up to keep ants out. And I'm going to tell you what I would fill it with, a neutral oil. A neutral oil because water will evaporate and they'll eventually get in. But a neutral oil uh, is what I would use. And then a certain amount of uh, times a year, maybe empty and replace it. Uh, moving on, let's talk about black soldier fly compost. And there is a reason that I put those two 
uh, Verma composting and black soldier fly composting in order. Uh, I'll talk about the black soldier fly compost method here in a minute uh, and the byproduct that is the grubs that can then be fed to other livestock. But what I want to say first is what we end up with at the end of vermicomposting, worm composting, is worm castings. And this is a mixture of the worm's own uh, biological exudates, uh, the remaining material that was not consumed by the worms or other microbiology, and worm poop. It's all of those things together, and it makes this nice little crumbly substance that is gorgeous and belongs in everybody's garden. Black soldier flies produce something that we call frost, and we call them grubs, and we call it frost because nobody wants to hear the words maggot and maggot shit, but that's what it is. Black soldier flies are a critter that looks like an iridescent wasp. They don't sting. They don't bite. They really don't do anything as an adult. Uh, they fly all over the place. They freak people out. They look like a mud dauber wasp. And there are people that say, mud dauber wasps don't sting. That's because you've been playing. You've been playing with black soldier flies you thought were wasps. Because mud wasps do sting. And I have been stung. And I can tell you it hurts. Uh, when I was about eight or nine years old, I was mowing the lawn one day. I ran over some that were in the ground. And I had no shirt on, and it's one stung me right in the chest. I had a welt on my chest the size of like half an apple. I killed it, and I ran to my crusty old coal mining Ukrainian grandfather, and he goes, nah, it fucking hurts, don't it? Go see your grandma. She dumped a cure comb on it, which was all you got back in those days, and that just hurt more. Um, so these guys don't do anything like that. They're not harmful in any way, but they're a fly. They're a true fly, and so their grub is a maggot. And I personally do not feel, based on all the research I've done and the people that I've talked to, including the people who this is their thing. Like I, I talked to one guy that works with Bob Wells and he did a seminar with Living Web Farms and, and I was able to talk to try to get him on the air. He's working on a project. So he wants that done before he does an interview. I'm like, that's backwards thinking, but whatever, like stop hating money. Um, but I talked to him at length. And he agrees with me on this. The frost from the black soldier fly bins is not ideal for compost at that point. And he feels like I do. The best thing you can do with it is take it and feed it to your worms in your vermicomposting system and let them process it to another level. And then it's fantastic. Because it is very rich in microbiology, but some of the microbiology is not exactly what you're looking for. We are talking about maggots pooping out anything that they eat. And, and the way this question is, I'm not going to advance answer it right now, but if you want a question answered, that's the way to do it. The way you see it right there. That doesn't have to be all caps, uh, but at least that word question in all caps will make it more likely. I'll see it, and I will come back around to that adventure frog. Uh, but black soldier fly... Composting is great if you can get a lot of material that black soldier flies will eat. I had one guy, he's getting several hundred pounds of the leavings from juicing a week. Like a, you know, like a Jamba Juice facility or something is giving him like all the carrot and the wheat grass and all of this shit. And he's like, can I make bioreactor compost out of it? And see, this is what I'm saying. Not everything can be answered by one thing. What he's got is a massive amount of green and no carbon. He had no browns. He doesn't have a big pile of wood chips to go with it. And we need about 80% wood chips to go with 20% greens to do that right. Or 80% leaves or 80% some brown to go with all that green. And green doesn't mean a color. Just think of it as nitrogen dominant and carbon dominant. But what a great, what a great way to grow massive shit tons of BSLs, black soldier flies, um, BSF, black soldier flies, right? They, they'll just eat the crap out of that. They'll also eat things that you wouldn't normally compost and you wouldn't normally feed to worms. What won't they eat? Lignin. They have no interest in leaves, wood chips, anything like that, right? They'll, you can take a dead animal off the road and throw it into an active black soldier fly bin, and the next day you'll have clean bones. They'll eat an apple. They'll eat coffee grinds. So if you have a coffee shop that's willing to give you coffee grinds, they'll eat the crap out of that. But they don't want lignin. 
They don't want wood chips. They don't want leaves. But the beauty in that is there's probably a waste stream that if you need a waste stream, if you need a feedstock, you can tie into locally. Uh, I, I would think that any of these places, all these juicing places that the, the, the modern yuppie hippies are getting their Jamba juices and shit from would, would have that same waste stream. They have nothing to do with it. And you're probably going to be able to easily get it because they're, they're under no illusions that you're actually going to eat it. And they're probably not thinking you're going to feed it to livestock because it's not great livestock feed either, unless your livestock is a black fly soldier grub, right? We set up a bin with those and you can either buy babies, right? You can buy little worms from somebody else to seed it. Or what most people do is you just take a stack of cardboard with the edge exposed where you can see the honeycomb and the cardboard and make a bundle out of it. And those need to be up above where all the food wastes go. Black soldier flies are not like house flies. House flies land on food and they lay an egg directly on the food. The black soldier fly wants to lay its eggs adjacent to a food supply. And then when the babies hatch, they'll go into it. But they don't want to lay it down in there, mainly because the biological activity and the very nature of how aggressively these things feed is if they lay their eggs in there, the eggs are going to get eaten. So they, they've they evolved to not do that. But they will take out anything. Well, now you have, if you do the bin right, you put an angle in the bin. I can't get into this deeply, what the angle should be or whatever. And a way for the grubs to climb out. When that grub is going to go into its next stage, basically think of it like caterpillar, cocoon, butterfly, right? So you got fly maggot, cocoon, black soldier fly adult. It doesn't want to lay in that material defenseless in its kind of metamorphal stage either because his, its brothers and sisters will probably eat it. So it gets out. And what it does in nature is let's say there was a dead deer laying in the woods, a carcass, whatever a bear left behind. And the soldier flies would lay on the surface, the hair of that deer. And then the babies go in and they eat it to the ground and then they'll crawl into the ground. They'll burrow down. They hatch out and complete the cycle and keep going for the whole season. In a bin like that, there's no place to burrow into, so they seek a way out. And you put a, a something for them to crawl up and a way out in a bucket, and they'll self-harvest into that bucket. Once they harvest into that bucket, if you keep fish, you can feed them your fish. If you keep poultry, you can feed them to your poultry. If you have more coming out than you need at any given time, you can simply put them in a container and freeze them. You can also dehydrate them which a lot of people sell them dehydrated or freeze dried around. I don't think it's worth it. You just freeze them. And then you, you know, freeze them in however you want to do it. And then you take them out during your off season, feed them to your animals. Or if you're not wanting the grubs, you can let them just empty out, burrow in and produce and, and come back. I don't know. If you live anywhere in the southern United States that you need to ever buy black soldier flies, they will show up. And rotted dog kibble is the thing that I and several other people I talk to have found that like 100% of the time, if it's available and that smell that wafts out of it, uh, they it will attract them and they will lay eggs on whatever material you give them to do that. And they are so prevalent that last year, I went out in my shop where I had my two urban worm bags full of just red wiggler worm farms. And there's barely any room to get in there. That's why they're so good against ants. But what I think they were doing, they were probably laying their eggs in the zipper itself. And the babies are microscopic tiny, man. They're not really microscopic, but they're really, really little. I go in the shop and there's black soldier flies like everywhere. And I realized I left one of the bags open a little bit. So they had a way they could fly out of there. They were reproducing mute and, and metamorphosizing and not getting eaten by the brothers and sisters and flying. And I opened the bag and like there's black soldier flies all over inside my shop. So this was indoors in a place not really designed to attract them. And they still showed up and colonized both of them. And the, it, this is actually a negative. I fed a little bit too much. Their biology got up a little too much. It, it heated everything up from biological activity beyond the ambient. Uh, that it ended up killing worms in, 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 in my worm farms. I had to restart them. So just know that those need to be, in my opinion, outside. Your black soldier flies, you don't want them indoors. 
that means you're going to compost from like late spring to mid fall. And you're going to shut down that operation for the rest of the year, which is kind of nice. I like things that are seasonal and you can produce tons of those things. And there's a financial value to them. You're getting a compost and you're getting the product of the grub. But again, I recommend you feed the frost to your worms uh, as a second level of processing or put the, pr the frost into any other composting method. Windrow, high turn, tumbler, I don't care. Whatever works for you, go ahead and put it in the next one. The next one is what we call leaf mold composting. And I want to bring up a product I've been asked about a lot that Vavor has. Um, and I've been asked about using it for uh, bioreactor composting. I, I personally haven't tried one of these yet. I might request one from my rep uh, just to give it a, a pace through. But bioreactor composting is a lot of material. It's a lot of weight. And that's why we use a metal uh, goat fence, three foot high goat fence at a diameter of no bigger than about five to five and a half foot when we build them. I won't say any more about that right now. This is made out of a, a, a plastic or an HDPE. I'm not really sure. It's a 220 gallon capacity. That's, that's actually pretty impressive. Uh, and it can be adjusted smaller and larger. You can use fencing to make leaf mold, no doubt. And doing it with a bioreactor-like component to it, like a center breathing tube, I think would be a fantastic idea. The issue is, when we look at expense, um, three-foot goat fence is around a dollar a foot. You're going to need about 16 foot to make a five-foot ring with about a one-foot overlap. That's just pi, diameter, radius, circumference, et cetera. Um, and so you're going to also add then you know, another 50 cents a foot. And so to do that, you're going to end up right about the same price as something like this. So unless you have that material for other reasons, this I think would work great for a leaf mold composter. And if you made a small tube out of some sort of fencing like goat fence and wrap that with um, weed blocker and put that in your center and built your leaves around, you're going to get better airflow. I don't think you need to do that with leaf mold composting, but I think it, it's probably worth the five bucks of material to do it with. I think this thing will work really good for that. And let's talk about what leaf mold composting is. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's nothing but brown leaves. We're not going to use any greens. We're not going to end up with much of a thermophilic cycle if we do it all in one go and fill it up, which is probably the best way to do it. We are going to get a little bit of thermophilic. You're going to get a very low, slow, long thermophilic. Thermophilic means we have heat. And the reason you're going to get a very low, long thermophilic is you're going to have a very slow burn. There's very little nitrogen and a lot of carbon. So there's only so much fuel. So it's like a, think of it like burning green wood that will smolder for days instead of burn up in a good hot fire. And we don't want that in a, in a wood-burning stove or in a fireplace, but it's fine for this. What we're trying to do is cultivate leaf mold, leaf fungi, and the bacteria associated with them. And I need to note, like things like black soldier flies in worms and all kinds of little critters are going to invade your compost pile and be part of the process, and that's good. That's a good thing. Leaf mold, though, is one of the best garden amendments, one of the best mulches you can get your little hands on. And I'll give you the best way to do it. This is best case scenario. You have a leaf vacuum or you have a chipper shredder. And you put your leaves through it so they're all chopped up into much smaller pieces. If you don't have that, you rake all your leaves into a kind of shallow dispersed pile. Take your lawnmower and lawnmower. If you have a bag, mow it right into the bag. Then you can dump it out of the bag right in there. If you don't have a bagging lawnmower, then wind row your leaves. Spread them out. Make a pass with your lawnmower. Don't turn around and go the other way and blow them the other way, right? Come back around and then go over again. Keep pushing them in one direction until you kind of push them all up into one big long roll, rake them up, and put them in. We're not doing this so they'll break down faster, really. It kind of works out that way, but it's not what we're really doing. What we're trying to do is increase surface area. Since we're looking for biology to do the work, the more places those critters can get, the better. This is an analogy I'm about to give you. It's not the same, but it's the same but different, man. 
Think about it this way. You take a piece of cardboard and, you know, right on the flat, smooth surface of it, you hold a lighter and try to light it. It takes quite a bit of effort to really get it burning. And once it burns, cardboard burns pretty hot. It's basically wood pulp. But if we tear that cardboard and we expose that end where that, that kind of egg carton uh, structure is that we just talked about is a good place for uh, soldier flies to lay their eggs and you light it there, what happens? It catches much quicker. What if we tear it so that's exposed, but there's also like that paper thin bit of it and we like that paper thin bit of it and that burns back to the egg carton. It burns really fast. And that's simply because the flame has more access to surface area mixed with oxygen. When we shred up material like wood chips or we shred up material like leaves, that's what we're doing. We're opening it up. We're letting the microbes in. So we shred it. We get it good and damp. And I'm going to say like you want like a 70% moisture. Same thing as a bioreactor. You want to be able to pick it up and squeeze it. And if you squeeze it as hard as you can, a couple drops of water come out. It doesn't like gush. And it's even okay if you do that at first. Just don't keep it that way. Right? These people, think, there's people that like, it'll go anaerobic. It'll be fine. Nature knows what to do. Okay? Shred it up. Fill up any sort of... I, there's people that say you can do this just on the ground in a pile. Uh, it, it's going to result in crap going everywhere. Build yourself some sort of containment system. You can do it with old pallets. You can do it with the frame of an IBC with something in there to hold it in. Uh, you can do it with goat fencing. You can do it, again, uh, with something like this item here from Vavor. They're only 30 bucks. And they look really well built. But again, this is one, like I always try to, to be honest with you guys and tell you, I have not actually put my hands on that thing yet. So I'm, I'm basing it on reviews and looking at it and similar products. And you just keep it moist. And it will take about four to six months for it to really break down. And it will be optimum, just like a bioreactor in about a year. And the closer you go to a, like you could totally do a bioreactor that is regular compost, and you can totally do a bioreactor that is your leaf mold one, that is just leaves. And you can do one that's just wood chips. It's all okay. We'll get to that one at the end, okay? Um, but the leaf mold has so much biology and so much fungi because it's all lignin. Now, I'm going to tell you some things you can do to up your game on any compost, and this stuff can be used in any compost, especially when we're not in the thermophilic. We can inoculate with what I'm about to tell you how to do. But for leaf mold, it's gold. Number one, if you're getting your own leaves, you're not like picking them up from neighbors that rake them or some shit like that. Wherever you get your leaves from, when you pull all the leaves away and they're not laying in your grass, right? They're like up under trees and stuff like that. And you have the dirt under them. Take a small container and take about a half gallon of that dirt. And when you make your, um, your, your leaf mold uh, composter and you're filling it up, about every six inches, take a handful and sprinkle that dirt with all that microbiology. And there will be eggs of like microarthropods and all types of stuff in there. And it will colonize that whole thing. And basically, you're creating a giant detritus sphere. So when we look at the spheres of the soil, all that stuff that all that we call mulch in nature is detritus. And all these critters eat it. So we're seeding it with their eggs. They're Coons. Some of them are just going to be like, you're going to do, there's a roly poly in there, throw his ass in there. He'll be all right. He'll be happy. It will not bother him or her to move to that new location. He'll be good to go. Right. But here's the real kicker. Go into wood lots. When you go on walks in a park or whatever, go into the woods, look for broken down pieces of trees and limbs and stuff. Find a, a stick that's got white uh, mushrooms growing off the side of it or some kind of white strandy crap on it. anything that's like rotted and breaking down, bring that home, infuse that into your compost. And it can go in any compost, but especially leaf mold or bioreactors. I'm going to give you another level though. This is, this is taking to a level that most people would never get to. And I'm going to tell you my source, I always give sources on this idea. I've evolved it since then, but my original source on this idea is Nick Ferguson. Get a tarp. But again, I don't like true tarps for this. True tarps are great to put over a cover crop and kill it, right? We want complete light taken away. No, you know, we want it dead. We don't want this dead. I like using good quality, heavy duty weed fabric for this. Make a pile 
of all this stuff. And every time you go anywhere where there's woods, bring home a little handful of dirt and some wood material and build up a pile under there. Every week, lift it up and wet it down a little bit. Don't let it dry out. Put it somewhere it's 100% in shade. You're cultivating a giant pile of indigenous microorganisms. Whenever you make compost, just take a handful of that stuff, crumble it up, break it up, and infuse it. And you're turbocharging everything. But the leaves themselves, at least minimum, wherever you're getting the leaves from, take dirt from underneath them if they've laid there for a while. If you do your own leaves, don't rake them right away. Don't be like the yuppies down the road from you. It's okay if they sit there. The longer they sit there, the more they'll be inoculated from the property, from the IMO. If you're getting leaves from neighbors, then just go into a woodlot somewhere and take soil from under leaves somewhere. The, the microbes will know what to do. But if you shred, keep moist, and inoculate that leaf mold, that's gold. And that's one of the things I do in addition to bioreactor compost is leaf mold compost. And I use them differently. Bioreactor compost, I'll do direct applications. I make potting soil out of it, and I will do teas and extracts and things like that. Leaf mold, I just mulch. I just mulch around plants with it, and it is, it has exploded the worm and micro arthropod populations in my gardens, along with all the other practices we do. Next is tumbler composting. I'm not exactly in love with this, but I see the point, I guess, is what I'm going to say. Tumbler composting is where we're going to use a, a, a purpose-built piece of equipment. And it's basically a big black plastic tub. And it's on some type of stand where we're able to spin it like a lot, like, like a, a, um, a dryer, like a clothes dryer sort of thing, except it's not, it's not run by electricity. You have to go out there and manually spin them. I've never seen an electric one. And the way they work is simply you put all your compostables in them and you load them up. And the best way to use them, you can use them in a continuous comp, like you add a little bit, you add a little bit more, you add a little bit more, you add a little bit more until they're full. And then you keep spinning all the time. But you're doing the whole thing where you kind of started baking a cake and you took the cake out of the oven and you added batter to it and you put it back in the oven. And then you took it out before it was done and you keep adding batter, right? Um, and it also has all the problems of high turn composting is that we're disrupting the fungal hyphae, right? But I think if they're used as intended, which is you save up enough material to completely fill one. And then you put that through the process. They probably make as good a compost as any high turn. I also think they can be used for continuous compost if you use them intelligently. So Vivora actually makes two similar ones that have about the same total capacity, but they make one like I just had up. It has a single large bin. And then they make one with basically the same capacity, but it's divided into two bins. So you can spin one and the other. If you have moderate amounts of compostables and you want to like just have a continuous composting thing going on, and this works for you because it looks good. It keeps smelled down. It keeps rodents out. Uh, it's it's reliable. It's dependable. It's a perfect environment for your composting. Then this is the one I would recommend, the double system. And I would do that a lot like my trash can system that I've developed, which is basically a bioreactor before anybody knew what a bioreactor was, including me. But you would keep adding your material to this, and you you every three or four days give it a spin, a tumble, when it's completely full, start filling the other side and then keep every three to four days giving it a tumble. And when you fill the second one, unless you're really high volume where you should probably do doing something else, the first one will probably be done. Now, here's what I want to say about done. Done is not mature. Done is the, the compost has broken down and it looks good. It doesn't mean it's done. It means it's composted, but it's not mature. I would then dump that compost out and store it somewhere for at least 30 to 60 days before I used it to let it mature and build up fungal. And I would store it either in something that looks an awful lot like a bioreactor, right? Or an awful lot like the Vivor 
uh, cage, like the I call it a ring composter because I don't have a better term for it, where it can get good airflow and be kept moist. I would cover it and I would keep it moist and give it that time to age and mature. And I would say 60 days for any method of composting other than worm or uh, bioreactor. 60 days, let it mature. Treat it like wine. In fact, this is that's a great analogy. You make homemade wine. You take a five-gallon carboy and you take your six and a half gallons of, of, of uh, wine must that has fermented at one level and you transfer it to that five-gallon carboy. You stick an airlock on it and you, you let it secondary ferment until a hydrometer says it's done. Because if you don't do that, when you put it in a bottle with a cork on it, what's going to happen? You're going to have CO2 build up and pop, right? You're not trying to make champagne. You're trying to make still wine here, right? So you put it in the bottle. Do you immediately drink it? I mean, if you drink a glass of it at that point, it tastes okay. But what do we do with the wine then? We put it in a nice, cool, low light, dark area with it resting on the cork if we're using corks. And we give it time to mature. And that wine is going to take much, taste much better in six months than it does the day that you put it in the bottle. And it will taste even better at a year. And depending on what kind of wine it is, it will continue to improve. And eventually it will begin to decline. Think of compost very similar to that. And think of that minimum aging process of about 60 days. Everybody's in a hurry. But, you know, probably the, the best amateur soil biologist I know of in the world, even though he's kind of crazy with his hands and his voice and all, Matt Powers. When he looked at what I was doing, when I told him the results I was getting, he's like, the pH doesn't make sense at all. He came here, he looked at me, he said, you're patient. And I said, I don't know if I'm patient or lazy. But what I will explain about this is it's a lot like starting a business where you're getting sales in the beginning, but you're going through certain suppliers and all, and you don't have cash flow yet. It sucks. And that might be 45, 60 days before money starts coming out. If you ever think about becoming an Amazon affiliate, know that you will get paid for December's business uh, on March the 1st. And so your first check takes forever. But once you build up that cash flow, then it doesn't matter. The cash flow is, is steady. And that's how a lot of these composting things are. Once you get a process in place and you get your first output, then it doesn't matter anymore that it takes time. And it's much easier to be patient. That's why I like giving you guys multiple ways to do this so you can have short-term, mid-term, and long-term and over time, you'll probably transition to more of a long-term model. Even with your short-term compost, you'll give it that time to age. And I, I think it's really important that we get that understanding about that aging time. So the next type of composting is static pile continuous. And you, I'm going to throw in static pile uh, all in one with this because it doesn't really matter how you do this. If you're doing this, to me, it makes a lot of sense to do bioreactor. You'll get better results, and bioreactor bioreactors are static pile compost, meaning we never turn it. But static pile continuous can be done with a bioreactor-like design, or it can be done with anything that has good airflow. And I've seen plenty of people take something, again, like the Vivor ring composter, and all it means is you're going to start adding compostable material to it, and you're going to keep adding it till it's full. You're going to keep it moist. You're going to keep it out of direct sunlight, so somewhere in the shade, and maybe you're going to tarp cover it. So, And again, I like to use weed blocker for that. And just don't do anything. That's it. That's all there is to it. Now, there, there is some issues with this method. And the main issue is most people that do it, they're just going to do exactly what I said. They're going to get some sort of containment system, some sort of bin. They're going to nail four uh, pallets together. Uh, they're going to you know, build something out of fencing and they just throw a bunch of shit in there and nature will eventually break it down. But you're going to have a lot of anaerobic pockets and there's a certain amount of time that nature is going to need to fix this, right? To me, it is a great method of storing material until you're going to do another form of composting. That's, that's what it's best for. It's just like, I'm just going to store all this stuff here. If you think about it, it's what I do with my wood chips in, in an unconscious way, right? So I have right now probably 25 yards of wood chips out in my Westfield. I have bribed with beer 
dudes driving trucks that, that do uh, tree trimming to drop them off there. Every time I see one, I'm like, hey, guys, can you end it? Well, I don't know. What kind of beer do you drink? Right? And, and I go run out of store and hand them a couple six-pack or 12-packs, right? And then they're like, oh, now they feel obligated. Right? And the gate opens, just back up and dump it. And they'll be like, there's big logs and shit. I don't care. Just dump it. It's fine. And so that's a static pile of compost, but I never use it directly. Right? Uh, some of the oldest stuff I will use it as almost like a leaf mold. But mostly what I do with it is I use it with my composting in other ways. It's an adjunct. And that's what I mean, that static pile, continuous, that's kind of the best thing to do with it. Um, the other way I do this, it doesn't look like it, but it's what it is. I have a pit right next to my duck house. In that pit, any waste that doesn't go to worm composting goes in that pit. And right now, I, the only worms I have are in my uh, aquaponic system. I'm not actively worm composting right now because I have tons of worms. Somehow they're surviving. My fire ant problem seems to become less of a problem. And I'll, I'll give you a mid-story mid, mid uh, theory on this. So Howard Garrett, the dirt doctor, has always said, if you get your biological activity high enough, you don't have fire ant problems anymore, that they don't like it. It seems to have credence because I only have one spot in my main garden that still has a fire ant problem. And coincidentally, is the one place they have the poorest results in my garden. It's one end of one bed. I just can't get rid of the damn things. Uh, I keep killing them with the orange oil and all. Everything else, they're gone. And that's crazy for here. I think I've been bioreactor composting in the same spot for so long. There's so much biological activity in the soil around the bioreactors. They don't want anything to do with it. So I, I've had less problem with that. So I have the worms uh, working in there. Um but the, what I do with all the waste then is I have this pit. And the pit is made with old cinder blocks. And it's about six foot by six foot square with an open front. So it's, you know, three-sided. And in that pit, I throw all the kitchen waste. I also grow for my birds um, water plants like water hyacinth, duckweed, algae. Uh, that's not intentionally grown, but it ends up in there too. And, uh, you know, like water lettuce, water hyacinth, azola. And whenever I'm going to feed my ducks, I just, I have the pond directly behind the fence where the ducks can't get to and mess the pond up. I take the, the, the water plant straight out and I throw it in that pit and the ducks eat it. I throw biochar in there. Biochar works in all these compost methods. It's not a biochar episode, but I use biochar in everything. And so I throw biochar in there. The ducks eat the biochar. The ducks poop in there. They eat that. And that builds up. That's a static pile, continuous composting pit. And those of you who have been here to classes know what happens to that pit when we make bioreactors. We go to that pit, we get the wheelbarrow, we fill up the wheelbarrow, and as we're building the bioreactor, we're sprinkling that through the whole thing. And we're adding all that biology, we're adding all that nutrient. And so that's a way to combine. And I want you to start thinking about how do I combine these things? How do I take, because what happens now is, sure, the bioreactor compost maybe has 475 beneficial microorganisms. It doesn't mean that the leaf mold compost that has 200 might not have some that the bioreactor does not, right? Or a heavier population. So if we make, we take leaf mold, bioreactor compost, throw them in a bucket, mix them up to make an extract, strain it through a paint strainer and spray our plants with it, we've probably done more than either of them by themselves. It's a way to start thinking about it. So this continuous compost method, it makes okay compost. It makes great compost inoculum when combined with something else. There is another way to do this, though. And it's basically a shortcut attempt at bioreactor composting. And it's called forced air static compost. This is where we're going to take some form. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to highlight that, even though it's not a question, because I, I just want to comment on that later. That's kind of funny, uh, Jesse. Um, so we take some sort of pipe manifold that we make on the bottom of the pile. We build our static pile of compost, and it can be continuous or all in at the beginning. And then we have a timer, or we ourselves have enough discipline to go out there once or twice a day, flip a switch, 
and we blow air through the column. There's no way we're going to go fully anaerobic or even have many anaerobic pockets because we're literally forcing air through the pile. Now, I've seen some really smart people build a static pile and a static pile forced air side by side, same material, and let them go for six months to a year. Then break them down. Look at the compost. Diego Footer did this. And I really respect Diego. But he looked at it. He said, there's really no difference. They, they look exactly the same. They smell good. They're, they're nice and crumbly. They're, all, they're following the rules we've always taught with compost before we understood the biological side. Compost is ready when there's really no identifiable pieces left in it. It looks and smells good and it crumbles well, right? Okay, so if we judge those two composts that way, it makes perfect sense. Nature knows what she's doing. They're both going to break down. But which one's more biologically active with the type of biology we're looking for? So to me, the way to compare those two composts would be, well, let's make an extract out of both of them. Let's fill two separate tanks and let's do a foliar treatment of the same plants in the same soils separated from each other. Is there a difference in the response we get? Do we get a more intense response from the forced air? Or we need to put it under a microscope and start doing counts on bacteria and fungi under a microscope. That's the only way, that's the only way that we're gonna actually know if there's a difference. We're gonna somehow test them either with a, you know, a, a metagenomic analysis. So we could send, we could take the compost from both piles and you want, you want to keep everything except the forced air constant. You know, do actual science like they teach you about the scientific method in the sixth grade that scientists never do anymore because it's really a pain in the ass when it doesn't come out the way you want it. So you have to stack the deck in your study so the people funding your study will fund your next study, right? When we do actual science, we make a single variable. So same feedstock built on the same day, same material, same amount of moisture, same containment system, all of that, then take the two samples and send them off for metagenomic analysis, which can be expensive, but then we would know. Or we make a slurry and we inoculate seed of the same kind and plant it side by side. And we would probably need to do that with multiple plant species because it may not be that beneficial for one plant species, but it may be really beneficial for another. One thing you're never going to have in your compost, active mycorrhizal fungi. If anybody's selling compost to you and says it's full of active mycorrhizal fungi, they're stupid or a liar, and you don't want to do business with either. Mycorrhizal fungi can only be active if what is present? Living root systems. So compost does not have living root systems, so it cannot have active mycorrhizal fungi. It can have spores. But maybe one ends up with a lot of spores and one ends up with very little. But if we were to test that, and plant brassias in them, like let's say broccoli, cauliflower, and radishes, they would both probably do very well. Why? Does anybody in the chat here know why? If one had more mycorrhizal fungi spores than the other, it would make no difference if we were planting brassias. I know there's a lag. I'm giving a little bit more time. Okay, I'll give you the answer. Because brassias do not form mycorrhizal fungal associations. They're one of the few plant species that don't do that. So it would need to be a, plant, a variety of plant species so you knew what you were finding is a difference. Okay? You would need to have some form of that. So I think both of these methods have merit. I think the forced air method probably does make a better product, but I've never tested it and I've never done it. But I, I get the theory. Then there's what's called... Effective microorganism composting, also known as Bakashi. Everybody that does it loves it. Everybody that does it loves it. I am of the opinion that nobody is going to do everything, including me. I only have so many hours in a day. I find things that work, and I, I go all in on them. I may eventually do this just for the experience of it, but I do not produce a lot of waste that is not compostable in some other way. And that seems to be one of the main reasons people do Bakashi. They take things like citrus that, you know, they have a lot of citrus and it doesn't do well. So they Bakashi, they have a lot of dairy waste and dairy waste really is not something we generally compost. Though I believe we can. Um, and so they're, they're using it for that or they're using it because they're just a fan 
of like Korean natural farming and things like that. But here's the basics of it as I understand. You use like a wheat bran stuff that's inoculated and you use, you add to it EM1, I believe, which is effective microorganism formula one. And it goes into a bucket that generally has a spigot on it of some sort and also has weight. And it's a continuous addition. So every day or so you're bringing new material out and adding it to this bucket and putting the weight back on it and it and you're draining off a leachate. And you're basically doing a, a, a fermentation here, like a lacto-fermentation style ferment. You're pickling the waste. And that leachate can then be diluted and used as a plant nutrient feed. So we're, that's a direct like soil application. But eventually when this stuff's completely broken down, you do pit trench style composting with it. It's a pickled waste. It apparently does not work really well as a direct compost. So we're doing like digging that trench and then we're adding that to our garden and covering it over. And again, if you use it some other way and I'm getting that wrong, I'm very honest about things I've never done. Um, I have never done forced air static, but I'm pretty comfortable speaking about that because there's so many things exactly like it. I've never done this. So I just want to throw it in there for you because some of you may want to try it and you may have specific waste streams that are applicable for it. And this is where I have said, again, there's no best composting method. Um, M Mitchell here is saying he's done Bakashi composting for four years. It's been great. A complete closed loop if you want. So, you know, he probably has a waste stream that's ideal for this. And it, so what is your waste stream and what is the volume of your waste stream and what time do you have to compost? How much space do you have? What are you composting for? One small garden or a three acre property? All, do you have livestock in your system or not? See, it always changes. Some of the livestock in their system or growing fish, black soldier fly makes a lot of sense because you get a food product in addition to a fertility product, right? Um, but that's, that's all I'm going to say on Bakashi because that's all that I really know. But I do want to say something else. When I first heard about this, my first thought was, boy, you better not feed that to worms. I can't imagine like taking like spoiled coleslaw that I left in the jar in the back of the refrigerator to, and it over lacto fermented and it's nasty and dumping all that acid into a worm farm that. But then I looked it up, and there are tons of people feeding Bakashi waste to worms. And I don't know about it. I've only observed that there's plenty of people doing it that are happy with it. And so, therefore, I know it can be done. And if you want to do it, then I'm going to advise you to do your own research on that one. I'm not going to give you advice on something I haven't done, and or I haven't at least interviewed enough people that do it to verify exactly what I'm saying is correct. That's all I have on that. Last is the bioreactor compost. I'll say very little on it because I've talked about it so much and I have a full course for it. But what I've learned over the years of doing it is that the right word for it will never use. It's really bioreactor is not really the right words for it. The problem is the best phrase for it is already used to describe something very different. But the right terminology, in my view, for Johnson Sioux bioreactor is biodigester. And I always felt that way, but something happened this year that like reinforced it to a very high level. So I built two bioreactors in the November class, and when you build a bioreactor, what's going to happen is your volume is going to re reduce by about two thirds. You're going to put about a third at the very end, but it's going to reduce to almost half very quickly in just a few months. That'll be the main breakdown of what goes on with actually breaking the material down. And so you're taking up all this space. And I don't really want to turn bioreactors. It's a static compost pile. But what I ended up deciding to do was take two, Fill up one and let them mature the rest of the way that way and see what happens. I'm not, I, that is now a bonus video. If you pay for the course, you need to know there are bonus videos in the course. I have not put that video out publicly, not because I'm, you know, holding it hostage only for students, 
Because if you're a student of the course and you got through the course and you watched it, you know what you're looking at. If I just put it on YouTube for everybody who hasn't had the education to go along with it, you think I'm saying this is what you're supposed to do. And I am not. I also built a new design of the bioreactor using, instead of pipes, using um, seven tubes made out of uh, small pieces of fencing with the uh, weed blocker wrapped around them so they stay permanent and the holes don't collapse. Again, if you've had the course, you understand what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you're, you're thinking I'm saying you have to do this, and I'm not. right? But I, I just want you to understand what I did. When I broke those down, and they again, they were about three to four months old, it was like taking the rumen out of the second stomach of a cow. It didn't smell bad, but it didn't smell great. It didn't smell anaerobic at all. It was incredibly bioactive. There were worms going everywhere, all kinds of critters in there. But it, I just looked at it and said, this is a digestion. This is biology eating and digesting this material. And a lot of that biology is worms. And so... I, I really encourage you, even if you don't get my course, to learn about this method of composting. Because to me, it, again, it's not the, the best method for everything everywhere. But the resulting compost is the gold standard for where you're trying to get to. And the course that I put together really does a good job. And, and this is why I, so I figured I'll take the, the compost method that produces the best result if you have the material, but I'll use it to educate on the composting process as a whole. So about half the course is how to do a bioreactor and about half the course is how compost works and how to use compost. And I do want to say a little bit about that, all these composting methods, when you get that end product. We have been conditioned in a commercial society to always think more is better. Right. So people buy a modem for their house and they buy the one with the faster speed, not realizing that it, or a wireless router doesn't matter how fast the speed inside your house is. Unless you're transferring lots of files from like computer to computer inside your home, your freaking modem going out to the world. That's your bottleneck. Like some people really are like they have big files in this server that they build their own server in a closet somewhere or a bathroom, Hillary. Right. And they need to move files on their own network. And yeah, then if you have a, a higher speed connection inside your local network, right, then it matters. But if you're going outside, it, it, it doesn't matter that it's faster. So we have this faster, bigger, better mindset. And then we buy compost. And when we buy compost from a commercial compost facility, which is usually shit compost, it's usually gone uh, it's usually gone anaerobic multiple times. It's usually not fit. It's not just not mature. It's not finished. Um, and it, it has various other problems with it. But what do we buy it by? Do we buy it by the bag or do we buy it by the ton? Well, we buy it by the ton. And so then we go and we put like six inches or eight inches of compost across our gardens. If we're making really good bioactive compost, it's more than you need, but it's not going to hurt anything. I literally grow my seedlings in pure, like compost. This is how I make my potting soil. It's, and I do have a video on my YouTube channel that shows this. Compost, biochar. It's all I need. But I also use perlite. I use per perlite because it's white and you can see it. And it's cheap. And you can buy giant bags of it and you have enough for years. And it never breaks down. It never goes bad. And it helps add tilth. But the main reason I do it is that way when I mix it, you put the biochar in there, you can't see it. So when you mix it and you have even white little pellets distributed through all your potting soil, you, you know that you mixed it good. That's the only reason I use it. So it, that works just fine. But a lot of times if you buy compost and you use large amounts of it, you get bad results. And Paul Wheaton will say, it's persistent herbicides. Maybe, but probably not. Maybe it probably, you know what it probably is? Salt. A huge amount of commercial compost is made with dairy manure. And while pass-through herbicide is a problem, the fact that those animals, the way that they're fed and that that compost was never as highly bioactive as it was supposed to, you can end up with like by dry weight, 5% salt. Think about what that means if you put two tons on a garden. 
how much salt that is. Would you go out and get salt and put that in there? And if you get your biology up, eventually that salt will be rendered inert. But <laughs> this is why there are really smart, like PhD level agronomists who say that compost is bad for soil. Dr. Johnson even talks about this. And one way to mitigate that is not to use large amounts of compost because we were looking for biology, not fertility. The biology makes the fertility. So the best way to use this compost, in my opinion, all of it, is using um, compost extracts, not teas. And you'll learn all about this in my course if you take the course. But when we make a tea... We take the compost and we usually take some sort of food, some sort of sugar, like uh, brown sugar or horticultural molasses, right? And maybe some other things that we infuse in it. We stick that in a bucket. We put some air stones in it and we run. And I taught this for years until I learned like another level of things. And we run that for 24 to 48 hours and we explode the population of microbes and then we apply that and it works. But what have we done? There are some microorganisms that are like sugar, water, oxygen, woohoo, and they just go ape shit. And they multiply and they dominate the ones that are like, man, it's okay. But if we just put it into a bucket of water and stir it up with our arm or take a, uh, a mixing paddle on a drill and run it on low speed for a good minute, minute and a half, or use air, air stones work just fine. Just you only need it for five to 10 minutes. All we're doing is knocking the biology loose and we apply it and we get the diversity. That's one of the best ways to use compost. Another really great way is get it wet into a slurry, put it all over your seeds and then let them dry out before you seed. Now, commercial operation, you really need to let them dry out. So they'll go through a seeder, right? For, for home-based stuff, man, you can, like you're doing beans or something. When you're, when you're doing your inoculation with your, uh, Rhizobacterium that you buy to go with your beans, just at put the rhizobacteria that you bought into the compost slurry and inoculate it and plant them into the ground. Now you have the biology on the outside of the seed. And the second that rootlet pops out, they form that association. And so that plant from its infancy, almost prenatal, it's already got that association. Now, we do this all the time with what I just said, legumes. You know, we get cow peas. We use like a peanut inoculum. If we use something more like a green bean, we're going to use a more conventional uh, legume inoculum. And it's one species. We can be doing that with all the species. But we don't always need to be using huge amounts. Now, I say since we're using garden level, I make bioreactor compost. I'll throw an inch or two a year on top. Don't worry about it because I ain't worried about salt. But mostly what I do with it is two big hand, well, actually one big handful, one big double handful. So your two hands together in a bucket, mix it up, strain it through a paint trader bag into another bucket and drench and spray my plants. I can do that every two, three weeks. It's amazing what it does. Uh, here at the end, let's go ahead and handle a few questions. Uh, lots of them today. And if you have any more questions, the time to get them in is now, especially if you don't see it as I get toward the end. And I'll tell you when I got like two left. Uh, the word question in all caps will make it more likely. Uh, but Dark Horse Production sent me a super chat for 425 and said, thanks for all you do, Jack and the community. If you want to make sure I never miss you in the Q&A section, if you throw me even 99 cents, it'll automatically star. Not a question there, but thank you for that, uh, Dark Horse. Next up today, Joe H., Jack, I dig deep litter confinement of three head of cattle for the first few months of winter. I'm left with three to four yards of cattle manure hay mix. My plan was to put it in a windrow and let it sit a year. It'll work. The magic number is 18 inches, though. Dr. Johnson will change his tune on this. He'll say one talk, he'll say 12 inches. The other, he'll say 18. I've measured it, and you get with good tilth type compost with good material, you get about 18 inches, you'll have oxygen exchange about 18 inches into the pile. So the problem with like a three foot windrow of that material, it will break down, but the center is going to be anaerobic. And the way that we conventionally handle that is what? With turning, right? But that's a lot of volume. That's uh, three to four yards. You know, three to four yards is two bioreactors, man. 
Now, the thing is, there's only a little bit of hay mix in that was probably. So you're probably looking at more like four to six bioreactors if you're mixing that with enough carbon. Um, I don't know, man. I, I would, you know, and my other question then would be, how are these cattle being fed? A lot of like cattle that are grain fed and all, they're also being given large amounts of, of salt based uh, minerals. And so their manure can be as high as 10% salt uh, by dry weight. So wet weight, no. But if you dry it all out. And when you're doing bioreactors with cattle manure, it is a really great idea to completely dry it out and then rehydrate it along with the carbon when you do the bioreactor. Uh, in fact, Dr. Johnson will actually take dried cattle manure and put it through a chipper so it's broken up after it's dried, not before. So this is not something that I have a great deal of experience with, but I can tell you that it is where the majority of the opinion has come from that compost is bad for soil has been windrow composting with large amounts of cattle manure without a balance of carbon and without sufficient biology to render the sodium inert. So I would say think about how you do it would be one way to look at that. Uh, next is, uh, the Santos lives. He says, Hey Jack, never seen worms attracted and love anything like rabbit poop. That is true. If you have rabbits, you have worms wherever the poop falls. Like literally, like you can let it fall on the ground under the cage and you move the poop aside. It's full of worms. It is fantastic worm food. It's also one of the few true cool manures, meaning that we could take rabbit manure without composting it and put it straight in our garden. It also is fantastic for worms in a worm farm. And um, the other thing I've seen worms just devour is quail manure. And I don't know why they like it more than chicken. I can't imagine that it's that much different. But I've seen quail hutches kept over worm bins. And you can't see anything in the – like as fast as it's hitting the soil, they're consuming it. And I've also seen worm bins where guys are doing the more conventional like pan in the bottom of the quail cage – Kind of like a big bird cage, like a big bird cage for like parakeets and shit, where they they're putting down like um, something like uh, aspen shavings or something, and then they're waiting every three or four days, and then there's just a ton of that stuff in there to dump it in in bins. And by the time you get the next batch to go in the bin, you open the bin, there's nothing on the. They eat everything. They completely devour it, and you know you put that in there, and if you go in the next day, there's half of it's gone. But when you move it, it's just flying with worms. Uh, but rabbits are. I'll tell you that I have talked to a lot of people that keep rabbits and they say, even if I didn't eat them, I would keep a few rabbits just for the manure stream for fertility. That's uh, not something I've done, but yeah. Uh, Adventure Frog says, dealing with black soldier fly larva smell, question mark. <sighs> Here's my opinion on it. They don't smell terrible and they don't smell good. So they go outside in the shade away from the places you don't want to smell them. I do not have a solution to make it smell like roses. I just don't. I would say that if like you were growing a whole shitload of aromatic herbs around there, that would probably help, you know, like mints and things like that. But I, if anybody's got a solution to that, let me know. And I will tell you that the compost tea that I have made and had other people make for me using frost stinks like garbage. It stinks like garbage. And this is why I'm a big fan of taking the frost and processing it through another secondary form of composting. I personally think that what we put on our plants, you know, there are people like Elaine Ingham. If you wouldn't eat it or drink it, don't put it on your plant. I'm not going to go that far. I'll use Dr. Earth 444 uh, gold compost. I think it's fantastic. Uh, it has amazing results I've had with it. I'm not eating it, right? I don't need to eat it, but it should at least smell. It should smell good. Things that don't smell good to us, I don't think really help plants very much. So uh, that's why I like that secondary processing. If anybody has a way that you do BSL, um, BSFL, and, and you uh, have a way to deal with the smell and you're in a live chat, tell us now. And if not, send me an email with TSBC in the subject line to Jack at the survivalpodcast.com, and I will hold, hold, talk about it in the future. Uh, Josh says, any insight on starting with hot 145, and then instead of turning the pile, soaking it in activated EM solution for six to eight weeks? I have no experience with that. 
I have no experience using EM on a static pile. Because what you're talking about is basically building a compost pile, letting it thermophilically heat up, not turning it, and then inoculating it with EM. I just don't know about that at all. Uh, Gooley says, how do you prevent septoria leaf spot? <sighs> That's really not a question here for today's show, but I'll, I'll try to give you a general answer. First of all, I've never had it. I've never had to directly deal with that particular problem, but there is a terminology that I'm really hoping to address. I wish I had addressed it in my compost course. I'm definitely going to address it in my cover crop course that I want to get away from bad guys and good guys. I think we have to get away from that terminology. And septoria, I think, is a fungal infection. And we would say it's a bad guy fungus. When we look at nematodes, we like, like something like a root knot nematode, and we have a predatory nematode. And we say the root knot nematode is a bad guy. And the other nematode that is a predatory nematode that attacks pests is a good guy. And it's very easy for us to think of that terminology. But in nature, I don't believe that we have good guys and bad guys. I, I don't think that a soil bacteria or a soil fungi can be malicious of intent, if that makes sense. And so I think that all of these things have places in ecosystems. And if you're having a fungal spot infection on a plant, it means that that plant in some way is unhealthy. Or it is some way being treated improperly. So we have an uncovered soil environment and we're having water from above and it's bringing the fungus up and pasting it on the leaf. So we cover the soil, we improve the biology, the problem goes away. I would tell you that probably the number one thing that you can do to deal with anything that's disease like that is bioreactor compost, spraying an extract foliarly. And I cover this in the course. And I also cover one of the other things I've done when I've had plants, not with this particular problem, but you know, they, like, they look like they have some sort of a disease. I will go into one of my bioreactor mature compost piles. I will pull some about a handful of compost out. I will completely drench it and I will, it rolls like clay. It's how it's a different type of texture. It'll roll like clay, but you can still break it apart. It's, it's crazy. And I'll make a little marble, like, you know, the size of like a really big quail egg. And I'll dig a hole right next to the plant and I'll just pop that in there and cover it over. And I'll give it, and, and almost every problem I've had goes away. It just goes away. Um, improve the soil biology and most of your pathogenic problems will go away in time. The other thing to do is you remember what I said about chemistry in the beginning, like biology greater than chemistry, but it doesn't mean we throw away chemistry. You may really want to have a soil analysis done for minerals. If you have a specific mineral deficiency, it can open your plant up to illnesses and diseases. So for instance, we know in areas with depleted selenium in their soils that are like third world areas where they're not getting a lot of imported food that with, and then you test the population, they have low selenium blood levels. Those people get a lot more serious cases of things like the flu because they're deficient in selenium. Plants are no different. So you may want to have a soil analysis done to see if there's specific micronutrients that you're deficient in, because again, no matter how much we compost, unless we're bringing those minerals in, we have a star in our backyard making new elements, then we we don't have them. Uh, next up, this is the one. It's not really a question. It's just something Jesse said. Jesse said, Detritosphere would be a great metal band name. I think it would. I think it would. Um, Detritosphere. Right. With lead singer, Garbage Man 1, right? Uh, Hardway Alaska says, thoughts on humanure? And boy, you asked that a bunch and you finally got the word question in front of it. So humanure is taking human waste and turning it into compost. I do not have experience with it. I don't advise people on things that I haven't actually done because I think it's disingenuous and wrong to do so. My understanding is that it is generally done in a static pile compost environment, and it takes a full year to mature. I see no reason that it would not do well in a bioreactor style. 
but I do not have experience with it. Um, I do not compost my manure or my wife's manure or anybody else's, and I just don't want to. Um, you would want a compost toilet solution. You're going to be adding carbon in that solution. And my understanding is the way that most people do this. It's kind of the shit in a bucket method, right? So you have something that looks like a regular toilet, but underneath it, there's something like a five gallon bucket and you poop in that and pee goes somewhere else. Cause liquid and solid do not go together when you're dealing with human waste. And so you go do a number two and then you would add a big handful of wood chips or pine pellets or some carbon that keeps the stink down. I would highly suggest making biochar or buying biochar and a small amount of biochar at least every other time. And then once that's full, that is dumped into some sort of static pile. And once that static pile is complete, that gets a full year and then you can use it. It's up to you if you want to do it. But I don't have a lot of experience doing it. Now, what I do is I have outside places where there are containers that have wood chips in them and they have wood chip containers next to them. And if I'm out there and I got to take a leak, I take a leak in there. That's a lot of nitrogen. And I add wood chips to that. And that will go into some other form of compost eventually. Uh, so I will harvest that human waste stream. To me, it's just more pleasant to deal with. But it's up to you if you want to do that. And again, it's just not something I have expertise in. Uh, 229 Mick, would you think chickens in the garden during the off season will add more than they take out? My birds work the mulch leaf pile down, but also eat worms and seem to work. But I'm curious. Yes, I do. And I have a great story for you about an upcoming guest. Um, the Cluster Cluck, right, um, is, the, is the, the brand name of the thing. And the guy's name is escaping me right now. It's behind it, including his stock cropper, I think, is what the, the channel is called. Uh, I'll add it to the show notes if I remember when I get done here. Um, but I have this dude coming on. I found him on John Kemp's podcast. He's one of the very few people I listen to one time. and like, I got to get this dude on. And he's building these systems that are designed to work in mainstream ag, but he's also building like his first products that actually go commercial. He plans on selling to people concerned about, in his words, protein sovereignty. And I love that terminology. And they're basically like a chicken tractor, or he's actually made them with like chickens out one side, pigs out the other, or chickens out one side, cows out the other. And it's like a barn. And then it has an outside area. And the way he designed them for large scale is they're like, you know, they go into like, a, they fill up like an 18 foot row. So you have like corn and then you have a cover crop and they're 18 foot rows. And then you have corn and a cover crop. And he's trying to design them for large scale ag. They're autonomous. They move themselves every day. They open and let the animals out and back in every day and just cool as shit. So that's why I got him on. Well, he just posted something last week or maybe this weekend on X. This was the coolest shit I have seen in my life and I would have lost a bet on it. He took the smaller one that he's designing for more like homesteaders, permaculturists, you know, off-gridders, et cetera. And he has his yard, just a yard with grass. He let it make one pass and then moved it somewhere else. So you've got like this area that's, and I think the, the chicken one is only like 10 foot wide. This area is like 40 foot wide. He has one 10 foot strip in the winter while all the rest of the grass is brown, not because it's dry, because it's winter and the whole strip is green. But wait, there's more. <laughs> if you look at it, there's a certain grid pattern for the base of the barn. And these are areas the chickens can't touch the ground. Yeah. You can see those areas. They're still brown and it's green all around. There's like stripes of brown in the strip of green. Those are the places the chickens couldn't peck. So it's not just nitrogen for the poop that's greening the grass early. It can't be. It can't be because that's the, the, these are small strips. These are like a couple inches wide. If it was just nitrogen in the poop, it, it would just green up too. And I'm sure it will all do well when it warms up. It's the beaks and the scratching. The microcultivation cause this whole strip to turn bright green. I can't wait to talk with him about that. I think I've got him coming on in a few weeks. Uh, and then I have a Josh Mitchell question here. He says, so the Bakashi method could theoretically apply to a large compost pile build. Maybe. I don't know. I, 
I have never heard of that. Now, inoculating compost with Bokashi affluent or Bokashi itself, I've heard of that. I've never heard of like a giant Bokashi pile. And so if that's what you're asking, I'm just going to say I don't know. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any more questions. Prep to adventure. Have you heard of green, brown, black when discussing ratios? I've heard of it before, but not much comes up on the Google machine. I have not. I guess somebody's trying to be clever and say like, a green is a nitrogen, a brown is a carbon, maybe a black is pre-composted compost. I don't know. Never heard of it. Uh, I think somebody's trying to be clever is what it sounds like. I'm not saying uh, I don't see. I, nope. That's all the questions I got. So I am going to uh, wrap up. k Bonk says, who is this? I think he's talking about the stock cropper guy. Let me see if I can find his name real quick here. Again, I know the product is called the Cluster Cluck. <laughs> the Cluster Cluck. Uh, the Cluster Cluck Max 9. Um, I'll shut that off there. The Stock Cropper is the YouTube channel. I'll put up in the uh, some reason this thing's talking. And uh, that's the dude right there. If you're seeing, no, you're not. Let me get that up. Sorry for the, but this is the the guy's channel right here, and uh, really cool dude. And uh, he's got these pieces of equipment. There's one of the smaller ones right there. I know that the people listening to the audio can't see it, but the stockcropper.com is his website. You can learn more from there. I am really stoked about having this dude on and, and props to John Kemp. Uh, John Kemp has a podcast. I think it's called Understanding Ag or something like that. But the guy's name is John Kemp, K-E-M-P-H. Uh, I've never seen him. I think he's an Amish background and maybe he has an issue with being on video or something. I don't know. I know he does a lot of workshops and stuff like that. Tremendously smart dude. I have learned so much from his podcast. He's got like a hundred and some episodes. I think he's the number one podcast on iTunes in Earth Sciences. I'm sure it's not a hugely competitive category, but he's a new, you know, he's only got 110, 120 podcasts and he's number one in a category that's pretty badass. It's impressive and totally uh, worth checking out. Anyway, with that, uh, just real quick, uh, kind of fitting in with today, again, the item of the day today you can find at the Survival Podcast is uh, uh, this Vivor five tray worm composting bin at 69 bucks. This is a deal. Um, several of you bought it at 89. It went on sale. I put it up. It, I put it up on a weekend while it was on sale by Monday. It was not on sale anymore. They just brought it back on sale yesterday afternoon. Uh, so I have it out today. It's 19% off. This is a great composter and it's bigger than it looks. Um, it, it's got, you know, it can do quite a bit of material. And again, it's got five trays. It's built for the purpose. Um, really love the way this thing is built. And I'm looking for a picture that will give you an idea. That gives you an idea of scale there, I guess. Uh, there you go. There's so it's 15. It's about 16 by 16 square uh, by about 26 inches tall. So with worm composting, that's an awful lot of compost and an awful lot of worms. It's got a great little spigot for taking out your worm leachate, which is a great compost. Uh, uh, you know, kind of an adjunct that comes out of, and again, it's got these little cups that the feet go in to keep ants and invaders out, which should be somewhat effective. And I definitely recommend you check this thing out. Remember, you can always find my item of the day at the survival podcast.com or by going to tspaz.com. If you have taken the bioreactor compost course today, you probably got more out of this episode than people who haven't. Uh, even though you already had the course. Like, see, I try to build my coursework so that every time you, when you take a course, then you actually can learn more. It's not just what you learn in the course, but you learn enough to learn more. And so if you want to learn more about composting and you haven't taken our Bioreactor Compost course today, please consider signing up for it. There's a link in the video notes or the audio notes for today's show, or you can go to homefoodsystems.com. The image on the screen right now, you know, I believe in results and testing. So what you're looking at is two stuck plants there. Uh, they're both the same plant. They came off the same plant. They were stuck on the same day. It's a plant called longevity spinach. It's really easy to root. One is in Fox Farms soil, which is great soil. 
The other one's in my compost. The difference, if you've seen the picture or you're watching it right now, is night and day. There is no comparison. I didn't give either side any fertility. I guarantee you the NPK is higher in the prepared potting soil from Fox Farms than the biological compost that I've got there. But biology is biology. And biology trumps all because who fertilizes in nature? Microorganisms. Think about that. Like one of the things we need to really think about, and this kind of ties in with today's composting. And again, if you want to take the course, please do. And if you have taken the course and you enjoyed it, please give us a review. We've had hundreds of people take it and only a handful of reviews. All the reviews are five star. If you want to give us four stars, three stars, one, I don't care. I need more reviews. I want honest feedback on the course. So if you've taken the course, please consider leaving us a review. I'd really appreciate that. Um, and with that, I lost my train of thought where I was going. So I think I'll just go ahead and wrap up. I had some one more important thing to say, and now it's gone. It's just completely left my brain. But uh, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Tomorrow, we will have an interview because it's Wednesday. And Wednesday, if everything goes the way it's supposed to, will be interview day. And guess who will be on the air with us again, who was recently on us there? Expert council member. Sean Mills will be talking about solar and energy as a whole, off-grid energy, et cetera, specifically in relation to energy-related tax credits. How can you get your money back from the government and use it to improve your self-sufficiency and your energy independence? That's what Sean will be on to talk about tomorrow. Anyway, with that, guys, thank you for tuning in today. I'll catch you tomorrow with that interview with Sean Mills.